on World News Tonight. Boiling Point The UN warned of a new era of heightened climate crisis following the hottest month ever on record. More charges Former US President Donald Trump faces new charges in Mar-a-Lago classified document case. Settling the sailment Australia's Prime Minister puts his job on the line in backing a highly contested housing bill. And a cathedral charm projects sublime displays stained glass art on the underground cathedrals of Colombia. This is Adaderana World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here is Suzanne Chanelli. A very good evening and you are watching World News and tonight's broadcast will be my final report to you on key events around the globe. And our leading story today is on the global climate crisis as July 2023, which is this month, has seen the hottest month since records began. The UN chief also warned that the era of global warming has now ended and as the era of global boiling has arrived. July 2023, even with a few more days left to go, is still set to become the hottest month on human record. That's according to the World Meteorological Organization in a report published Thursday, which noted that the heat this month has been so extreme that it's virtually certain this month will break records by a significant margin. It added that the world has seen the hottest three-week period on record in more than a hundred thousand years, with figures based on average air temperature across the entire world. The global average air temperature in the first 23 days of July was 16.95 degrees Celsius, far above the previous record of 16.63 degrees Celsius recorded in July 2019. In response to the alarming figures, UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres on Thursday warned that the era of global warming has ended and that the era of global boiling has now arrived. Climate change is here, it is terrifying, and it is just the beginning. The era of global warming has ended, the era, the era of global boiling has arrived. The air is unbreathable, the heat is unbearable. Stressing that the level of fossil fuel profits and climate inaction is unacceptable, Guterres called on world leaders to stop making excuses and begin making substantial changes now. Meanwhile, in response to the record heat that the U.S. is experiencing this summer, U.S. President Joe Biden said at the White House on Thursday that the high temperatures will be more severe in the future, adding that no one can deny climate change. While mentioning that more than 600 deaths occur every year due to high temperatures in the U.S., he announced new steps to protect workers, including a hazard alert notifying employers and employees of ways to protect themselves from the intense heat. The latest announcement from Biden comes as nearly 40 percent of the U.S. population is facing heat advisories, according to a recent report by the National Weather Service. We now turn to Typhoon Doksuri, which made landfall in southern China after sweeping past Taiwan and the Philippines, where it killed dozens of people. It's the second strongest typhoon to land in Fujian after deadly Typhoon Meranti in 2016. The Philippine Coast Guard is racing against time to save the passengers of a vessel that capsized near Manila, killing at least 25 people. The ferry overturned on Thursday when passengers, alarmed by strong winds from Typhoon Doksuri, rushed to one side of the boat. Authorities said it is not clear how many people were on the ferry, but at least 40 people had been rescued. Typhoon Doksuri has since brushed past Taiwan before making landfall in southern China on Friday morning. Taiwan's Kinmen Island was battered by heavy rain and strong winds. Trees were toppled and thousands of homes left without power. Businesses and schools were shut amid warnings of landslides and floods. More than 300 domestic and international flights were suspended, and railway services between southern and eastern Taiwan were halted. Ahead of Doksuri's arrival, China's weather authorities issued the highest level red alert, warning the public to brace for heavy rains and gusts. Southern Guangdong province, which is along the coastline, prepared by tying boats to bollards in fishing harbors and placing sandbags at railway stations. Train services linking densely populated cities such as Shenzhen, Guangzhou and Hangzhou were also suspended. 
Russian President Vladimir Putin promised African leaders tens of thousands of tons of free grain following international condemnation for allegedly endangering the world's food supply by bombing Ukrainian ports and reneging on the landmark export deal. A promise made by Vladimir Putin at the opening of the second Russia-Africa summit. We will be ready to provide Burkina Faso, Zimbabwe, Mali, Somalia, the Central African Republic and Eritrea with 25 to 50,000 tons of free grain each in the next three to four months. Putin added that he would ensure free delivery of the products to consumers, but did not specify how he would carry out the plan. He went on to express his hope for the African Union to obtain full membership in the G20 group. Isolated on the world stage since Russia's invasion of Ukraine, the Russian president knows that he needs to do what he can to keep his remaining allies. On July the 17th, Moscow withdrew from the grain agreements reached with Kyiv in July 2022, brokered by the UN and Turkey. Immediately, several African countries, highly dependent on Ukrainian and Russian grain exports, voiced their concern, as prices on their markets soar and shortages are on the rise. Current chairman of the African Union, Azali Asumani, assured that Russia will become an even more privileged partner. Africa is ready to strengthen its cooperation with Russia in all sectors. Asumani also condemned the situation in Niger. He called for the immediate release of President Bazoum, who has been detained by the presidential guard. An appeal which was echoed by the Kremlin, the United States, the UN and the European Union. Niger's army has declared allegiance to the defense of security forces that overthrew President Mohamed Bazoum despite his defiant stance and global condemnation of the coup. In a statement posted to X, the platform formerly known as Twitter, Army Chief of Staff Abdul Sidoko Isa said that the decision was necessary to avoid a deadly confrontation between the various forces. Cars and buildings were set on fire in Niger's capital, Niamey, on Thursday, after hundreds of supporters of a coup gathered in front of the ruling party headquarters. Young men looted motorbikes, chairs and other supplies from the building. Other demonstrators waved Russian flags and chanted anti-French slogans, echoing a growing wave of resentment towards former colonial power France and its influence in the Sahel region. The demonstrations came as Niger's army command declared support for the coup carried out the previous day by soldiers of the presidential guard. Army Colonel Amado Adraman announced on state television that all political party activities have been suspended. A group of soldiers announced in a late-night televised address that they stripped President Mohamed Bazoum of power. Juntas in neighboring Mali and Burkina Faso have grown closer to Russia since they took charge in 2020 and 2022, respectively. They cut ties with traditional Western allies. Niger's role had become increasingly important for Western powers, helping fight a violent insurgency in the region. In a social media posting on Thursday morning, Bazoum vowed to protect hard-won democratic gains. In separate comments on Thursday, the head of African Union Azali Asumani condemned the coup and called for Bazoum's release. Lawyers for former President Donald Trump met with special counsel Jack Smith's office and were advised to expect an indictment. Trump and his spokesperson are disputing that they were told about an indictment. Attorneys for Donald Trump met on Thursday with prosecutors investigating the Republican former president's attempts to overturn his 2020 election defeat. That's according to Trump himself, the target of the special counsel investigation, who said on his Truth Social platform, quote, My attorneys had a productive meeting with the DOJ this morning, explaining in detail that I did nothing wrong, was advised by many lawyers, and that an indictment of me would only further destroy our country. He added he'd not been given notice if or when he might be indicted. Special Counsel Jack Smith is investigating actions by Trump, the frontrunner for the 2024 Republican presidential nomination, to try and reverse his loss to Democrat Joe Biden in the 2020 election. Where they're trying to steal an election, they're trying to rig an election. It means you have to turn over the election. 
We will never give up. We will never concede. It doesn't happen. You don't concede when there's theft involved. Officials have testified that during his final months in office, Trump pressured them with false claims of widespread voter fraud. Fueled by those false claims, his supporters attacked the U.S. Capitol on January 6, 2021, in a bid to stop Congress from certifying Biden's victory. Trump said on July 18th he received a letter from Smith stating he was the target of the probe. It is not uncommon for defense attorneys to meet with federal prosecutors before an indictment. Trump is already the first former U.S. president to face criminal charges, which he has sought to portray as a politically motivated witch hunt. Any indictment in the election case would represent a second round of federal charges from Smith, who was appointed in November by U.S. Attorney General Merrick Garland. Trump last month pleaded not guilty in Miami to a 37-count indictment charging him with unlawfully retaining classified government documents after leaving office in 2021 and obstructing justice. In that case, prosecutors have accused him of risking some of the most sensitive U.S. national security secrets. We're going into a short commercial break. We'll be back soon with more World News. Welcome back. Now with Australia's housing stocks at crisis point, Prime Minister Anthony Albanese has launched a surprise move to end the months-long stalemate in the Senate. In the Sunshine State, new homes offering new hope for social housing tenants like Simone Pauly. It's given us so much. Yeah. You know, it's not just given us a roof over our head. It's given us our dignity. Now with housing supply at crisis point, the Prime Minister is going back to the future, sending the Housing Future Fund back to the Parliament. I want this legislation to be passed. I can't be more serious. The Housing Australia Future Fund would invest $10 billion with annual dividends used to build homes, prioritising vulnerable women, veterans and frontline workers, promising 30,000 homes in the first five years. Now we find out there's a $20 billion budget surplus and still the government refuses to spend a single extra dollar on public and affordable housing. Industry and welfare groups support the plan, but the parliament does not. The Greens tonight demanding more for renters like Jessica. A rent freeze would be so helpful. It would give me comfort as a single parent. If the bill fails to pass the parliament again, the Prime Minister could opt for a double dissolution election, sending Australians back to the polls early with the joint sitting after the vote to decide the future fund's fate. Well, I don't anticipate that there'll be an election this year. Uh, but quite clearly, we have a mandate for this. Address inflation, address the rising cost of living. Don't threaten Australians with an early election. Every day in which the Greens and the Coalition block this bill, they are blocking new social housing being built. And now, another day closer to another vote. Over in North Korea now, Pyongyang uh, marked the day with a much-anticipated military parade. Russian leader Vladimir Putin also delivered a message to the North Korean leader Kim Jong-un celebrating what North Korea calls Victory Day. North Korea staged a huge military parade on Thursday night as widely expected to mark the 70th anniversary of the armistice that ended the Korean War, or what the North calls Victory Day. The opening ceremony for the event started at around 8 p.m., followed by the parade, which went on for about two hours. Government delegations of China and Russia, who had come to Pyongyang this week, also attended the parade. Radio Free Asia revealed a satellite image of the military parade, which showed large-scale military forces and weapons. In the image, it appears that more than five intercontinental ballistic missiles were rolled out in Kim Il-sung Square. And the unmanned aerial vehicles that were revealed during the parade are likely the ones that were on display at a weapon exhibition that Russian Defense Minister Sergei Shoigu and Kim Jong-un had visited earlier on Thursday. North Korean leader Kim Jong-un appears to have not made a speech this time, instead the North's defense minister likely did so. This is the 14th time that the military parade had been held since 2012 when Kim Jong-un took power and the sixth time that the event had been held at night. Meanwhile, Russian President Vladimir Putin delivered a message to the North Korean leader on Thursday. The message included Putin's gratitude towards Kim for North Korea's support of Moscow's special military operation in Ukraine, saying that this shows their, quote, shared commitment and resolve to counter the collective West and its policy. Putin's message also said their history of bilateral ties has led to a stronger economic and security relationship. 
Swedish Prime Minister Ulf Christensen is extremely worried about the consequences if more demonstrations go ahead in which the Quran is desecrated amid growing Muslim anger at a series of attacks on Islam's holy book. On June the 28th this year, two men stood outside a mosque in the Swedish capital Stockholm and set fire to a Quran. The book was the latest incident of Islam's holy text being burned in the country. Swedish Prime Minister Ulf Christensen said on Thursday he was extremely worried about the consequences if more such demonstrations go ahead. He told that further requests for protests where Qurans could be set alight had been filed with police. He said, quote, If they are granted, we are going to face some days where there is a clear risk of something serious happening. I am extremely worried about what it could lead to. Demonstrations against the Quran burning have been staged in a number of countries. On Monday, thousands took to the streets in Yemen, holding up copies of the Muslim holy text and denouncing Sweden and Denmark. Rules on freedom of speech in both countries mean that burning the Quran is legal, though both governments have said they deplore the act. On Saturday, thousands in the Iraqi capital, Baghdad, also demonstrated. That came after a man set fire to a book purported to be the Quran on a square across from the Iraqi, Egyptian and Turkish embassies in Copenhagen. Sweden's embassy in the city was stormed and set ablaze by protesters last week who were angered by a planned Quran burning. Turkey has also publicly condemned the burnings and could create a diplomatic issue for Sweden whose application for NATO membership Ankara can still veto. Stockholm struck a deal with Turkish President Tayyip Erdogan earlier this month at a NATO meeting in Lithuania. Sweden has accused other countries, such as Russia, of manipulating the crisis to damage its interests and its bid to join NATO. Prince Harry is to make the Sun's publisher to court over claims it used illegal methods to gather information on him. The Duke of Sussex alleged, alleges that he was targeted by journalists and private investigators working for newsgroup newspapers and now defunct news of the world from mid-1990s until 2016. A high court victory that both sides want to claim. Prince Harry is allowed to take the Sun newspaper's publisher to court. But the newspaper group have been successful in getting phone hacking claims thrown out. The strict rule is you need to bring these claims within six years of them happening or within six years of your, your knowledge. Now, in essence, the court has ruled today that Harry did have knowledge in relation to the phone hacking aspect of his claim. And therefore, he has brought this claim too late. <laughs> Central to Prince Harry's reason for being out of time is the claim there was a secret agreement between Buckingham Palace and the papers. One that prevented members of the royal family from taking legal action against the tabloids. Mr Justice Fancourt said there was simply no evidence of such an agreement. He described Prince Harry's claims as implausible. NGN considered it a win. In a statement it said... The High Court has today, in a significant victory for newsgroup newspapers, dismissed the Duke of Sussex's phone hacking claims against both the News of the World and The Sun. As we reach the tail end of litigation, NGN is drawing a line under disputed matters, some of which date back more than 20 years ago. He has that chance because the judge has allowed him to pursue other claims of unlawful information gathering. They were hoping to strike this whole thing out, but in fact it's going to go forward and we're going to hear about whether there was concealment of evidence, whether there was perjury, whether there was destruction of emails and whether there was lying at Leveson. Critically, these are the things that Newsgroup wanted to avoid talking about and have been trying to avoid talking about for many years now. There'll be no avoiding when the trial commences in January. It'll complete a lineup of cases Prince Harry has ongoing including against the publishers of The Mirror and The Daily Mail. Welcome back to World News and for more news, let's take you around the world in a minute. The remains of the German mountain climber who disappeared while hiking along a glacier near Switzerland's iconic Matterhorn Mountain in 1986 have been recovered as melting glaciers have caused the emergence of bodies and objects thought to be long lost.
British Formula E driver Jack Hughes smashed a world indoor speed record by hitting 218.71 km per hour inside London's Excel Centre in modified version of Electric Championship's Generation 3 race car. Teachers in Chile called a 24-hour national strike to demand that the government meet their demand for better work conditions. Protesters urged for the payment of the historical debt, a payment owned to teachers by the government since 1981, a plan to address school violence amongst others. An international group of marine archaeologists recently set out to examine the remains of the Antikythera, an ancient cargo discovered by a diver in 1900 with the purpose of expanding knowledge about the vessel by 2025. Two of the Vatican's top sexual abuse investigators have met with the members of an elite Catholic society founder in Peru as part of a special mission looking into abuse accusations revealed in a 2017 internal report, which including that a layman who founded the group in 1971 and led it until 2010, and three other high-ranking ex-members had abused 19 minors and 10 adults. And that wraps up this week's edition of World News. And thank you for your continued viewership over the years of our rundown. And with the closing of my chapter, I sincerely thank our team here at Dharana for all the support. Keep watching World News as we keep you up to date with the latest from around the world. And in case you couldn't watch us on air, you can always re-watch our programs on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash English. And we end this week's broadcast in Colombia as visitors marvel at a video mapping show at the underground Salt Cathedral in Zapacura. The show called Sublime projected images of stained glass windows from churches all around the world. Thank you for watching. Stay safe and have a great weekend.